Good morning. My name is Sarah Fitzgerald, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of the United Church of Christ Office of Communication, Inc., I want to welcome you to the 30th Annual Everett C. Parker Ethics in Telecommunications Lecture and Awards Ceremony. As many of you have known, we have been blessed that Reverend Parker has been able to travel from New York to attend this event for so many years. We wanted to share at the outset that we received word from his son yesterday morning that over the weekend Everett was hospitalized with pneumonia. But we are thankful to hear that his condition is improving and he's expected to go home on Wednesday. As we gather in this beautiful new sanctuary of First Congregational United Church of Christ, I'd like to call on its pastor, the Reverend Dr. Sid Fowler, to offer some words of welcome and our opening prayer. Good morning. I want to welcome you to First Congregational UCC. This congregation is so honored to have you here today, this morning, to celebrate your ongoing commitment to media justice. We especially are thinking of Everett Parker this morning and pray for his speedy recovery. And to all our special guests and award winners, Janelle Trigg, Charles Benton, to Reverend Jackson, we are blessed to have you in this place. Here, underneath these stones upon this soil, in our history, discussions about the founding of Howard University occurred. Here, Frederick Douglass spoke of celebrating the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Here, even Williams, Jennings, Bryan celebrated a vision, whether you like it or not, he celebrated a vision of the world without the misuse of alcohol. We celebrated here on the day Prohibition passed. Here, folks have been lifted up in song by Marian Anderson and uh, Sweet Honey in the Rock and John Shepherd. Here has been a sending out and a resting place for the March on Washington and a welcome table for hundreds of homeless folk through a dinner program. And then there's today. It continues even now. It's this place is a place for marriage equality and a new vision of mission and justice. So your presence helps us. We are blessed by you today because you set the direction for us in our future as well. We are grateful to you. Would you pray with me? New every morning, O oh God, is your grace and your love and your blessings. So wake up us up this morning to your newness. On this morning, bless those who gather and the food we have shared. For this hour, form us into a new community. Unite us in your work for justice, our work with media for the common good. And on this morning, shower your blessings and joy on Janelle Trigg and Charles Benton. May they feel your presence. May they know great joy. May they inspire us through their service. On this morning, touch Reverend Jackson's lips with your word and your wisdom. On this morning, wrap your healing arms around Everett Parker and whisper our prayers in his ear. May he know the love and respect and the thoughts that are coming from this community on this day. So wake us up, God, in this hour to your presence. Keep us diligent in your work, listening for your word and your call in this generation. In the name of Jesus, the good word made flesh. Amen. Thank you, Sid. The annual Parker Lecture is a special time for all of us bringing together a diverse group of men and women from both the old and the new media industries, from media advocacy and social justice groups, and from a wide variety of faith communities and faith organizations. This event would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. We greatly appreciate your support, not only for this event, but for the work we do all year long. As I read off your names, please let everyone know where you are sitting so we could acknowledge you at the end. Our lead sponsors, 
Comcast, NBC Universal, and Google. Our patrons, the National Association of Broadcasters. Is nobody going to wave? <laughs> Time Warner Cable and the United Church of Christ. Our corporate special friends, the law firm of Best Best and Krieger, the law firm of Lerman Center, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, and the Walt Disney Company. Our special friends, Council Tree Investors, DirecTV, the law firm of Kelly Dryan Warren, and the law firm of Wilkinson Barker Nauer. And last but not least, our nonprofit special friends, the Benton Foundation, Education Development Center, Intersections International, and the Justice and Witness Ministries of the United Church of Christ. Please join me in giving all of our sponsors a round of applause to express our appreciation for their support. We'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge some persons who are part of our audience this morning, or that we understood were on their way. From the world of the Federal Communications Commission, welcome to Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel and members of her staff. Jessica, thank you. <laughs> FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn and members of her staff. <laughs> Former FCC Commissioner Michael Copps. <laughs> we recognized Commissioner Copps with a special award last year, and both he and Commissioner Clyburn have delivered the Parker Lecture in recent years. Uh, we are also pleased to welcome former FCC Commissioner Gloria Tristani, who is also a former Managing Director of OC Inc. Uh, we may have some members of the staff of Commissioner Pye here. I don't know if he was able to make it. And former FCC Chief of Staff Blair Levin. We welcome former Congressman Bob Edgar, a former General Secretary of the National Council of Churches who now serves as President of our ally, Common Cause. Uh, we were hoping to welcome Inez, Judge Inez Smith-Reed, retired District of Columbia Court of Appeals judge, but I'm not sure she made it yet. And is Paul Montiero with us? Paul is uh, Associate Director of the White House Office of Public Engagement and its li liaison to faith communities, and we hope he'll be able to enjoy, join us as well. We're pleased that we have so many former Parker lecturers and winners of the Parker and McGannon Awards with us this morning. If you or your organization have been so recognized, please stand so that we can acknowledge your presence collectively. You'll be introduced to some members of the national staff of the United Church of Christ later on, but for now, if you're here as a member of the UCC, a clergyman or woman, or a representative of another faith community, please stand so that we can acknowledge you. And I want to do a shout out to Bob Chase, who I'm not sure stood up at that moment, but is another former leader of OC Inc. now with Intersections International. We're glad to have Bob back today. I want to take a moment to thank several individuals for their help with organizing this event this year. First, Ann Poston, Barb Powell, and Don Hill of the National UCC staff in Cleveland. We're so pleased Don is with us again this year, wherever you are. <laughs> Byron Adams of First Congregational Church, our meeting planner Roxanne Ladd and her colleagues for all their help behind the scenes this morning and throughout the months we've been planning this. And last but not least, Cheryl Lianza, our public policy advisor. Among many other things, Cheryl serves on our behalf as chair of the Telecommunications Task Force of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. She brings her own strong personal commitment to the public interest in media to all of the work we do together. Let's have a round of applause for all these folks. Those of us who are gathered here today do not always agree on all of the issues that are important to us. And we don't always agree on the best way to achieve those goals that we share. At the same time, we at the United Church of Christ believe that it is important to continue to try to find those areas where we can work together and to disagree civilly when we cannot. 
Through your presence here today, you have affirmed our shared commitment to those ideals and to the work that Everett Parker helped to pioneer more than a half century ago. At this time, I'd like to call on the Reverend Linda Jaramillo, the Executive Minister of Justice and Witness Ministries of the United Church of Christ. Before I share a word or 12 about Dr. Parker, I want to acknowledge the Justice and Witness Ministries staff who are here. If you would just wave and let folks know you're here. This is very special. This is a special one for the United Church of Christ and OC Inc. as we celebrate both the 30th annual Parker Lecture and Reverend Dr. Parker's approaching 100th birthday. Everett C. Parker was born in Chicago on January 17, 1913. From his earliest years, Dr. Parker was fascinated with broadcasting. One of his first projects involved producing programs about the economic plight of Chicago's teachers, which were broadcast on WCFL, the radio station owned by the Chicago Federation of Labor. Later, he ran radio stations in New Orleans and Indiana and worked for NBC's war program section during World War II. And he did key research about the potential for educational television. Dr. Parker was there at the beginning as the head of communications when the United Church of Christ was formed by a merger of two Protestant denominations in 1957. In this photo, as a procession moves through downtown Cleveland, you can see him at left doing his job by apparently trying to help a reporter do her job. <laughs> Sound like Everett? A short time later, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Reverend Andrew Young met in New York City with Everett and Truman B. Douglas, head of the UCC's Board for Homeland Ministries, to discuss how our churches could support the civil rights movement Reverend King complained that Southern television stations were distorting coverage of the movement, and in some cases editing the nightly network news to remove all references to the events that were unfolding across the South. Please do something about those TV stations, Reverend King said. Well, as you know, the rest is history. With support from the National Church, Dr. Parker traveled throughout the South, watched TV, recruited monitors, and began the long legal struggle that established the principle that the public had the right to intervene in the awarding of broadcast licenses. The owners of WLBT TV in Jackson, Mississippi lost their television license. And in 1980, the license was awarded to a minority control group, the first African Americans were put in charge of a powerful VHS station. The battle for civil rights has always been linked to the battle for voting rights. Today, as many of you know, has been declared National Voter Registration Day. And the United Church of Christ has joined with many other organizations in calling for a National Day of Action. Among other things, we've launched an initiative for several years known as Our Faith, Our Vote, Our Voice, to remind our congregations how important it is to vote and to understand what nonpartisan steps can be taken to promote voter, voting and voter registration. And as you know, that's never been so important in our history. We'd like to share a brief video with you that we've developed as part of this campaign. And as you watch closely, you may see a few familiar faces. Vote. For your friends. Vote for your family. Vote for the youth of America. Senior citizens. Vote for everyone. Everyone. It's our faith. Our vote, our voice. It's our faith. Our vote, our voice. Our faith, our vote, 
our voice. Vote for your neighborhood. For your place of worship. Amen. Vote for justice. Vote for justice. Healthcare, employment, education, equality. Our faith, our vote, our voice. It's our faith. Our vote, our voice. Our faith, our vote. And it's up to you. Usted si puede, vote. It's up to you. And you. And you. And you. Vote! Vote! For more information, go to ucc.org, Our Faith, Our Vote. Many of us have become concerned about the rapid growth in campaign contributions that are not subject to public disclosure. Fifty years ago, Dr. Everett Parker and his supporters had to travel from station to station across the South to review the, quote, public records that were kept in stations' file cabinets. Believe it or not, until recently, those records were kept in the same way stations kept them back in the 1960s. But this year, the United Church of Christ made progress on that front. Thanks to a new FCC rule, television stations and the top 50 markets will have to make their political files available online. This will provide critical information about the nature of political advertisements, particularly those that have been placed by the so-called super PACs. Taking a page out of Everett Parker's playbook, OC Inc. is also working with the Sunlight Foundation and Free Press to identify volunteers who are willing to visit stations in person so that the files from many additional markets can be shared more widely online. On another front, we are continuing to work to put a stop to the exorbitant rates that prisoners and their families must pay so that incarcerated persons can be in touch with the best support systems they have available, their family, and friends. Clergy are invited to stay after today's event for a discussion here at the church about providing pastoral care to families personally affected by the prison, prison industrial complex and the issue that will be the, those highlighted. Everyone should have found a flyer on your chairs with more details about this broken system. You will also see that we're getting a boost from Hollywood the upcoming movie, Middle of Nowhere, will provide a vehicle to help us educate members of the public about this important issue and provide an opportunity for them to weigh in at the FCC. Of course, the struggle to preserve, protect, and promote diverse media voices and access to telecommunication services goes on. Many of the people in this room were trained by Everett Parker. Others were inspired by his example. The issues and technologies and strategies may change, but the challenge continues. Over his long lifetime, the Reverend Dr. Everett Parker has never lost his passion for the causes with which his name will always be associated. Those who attended the Parker Lecture two years ago will remember how on that occasion, Everett asked if he could just say a few words, then noted politely, however very pointedly, that after all these years, the Federal Communications Commission still had never elected a female chair. Just saying. We're sorry that Dr. Parker could not be with us in person today, but we know that he is with us here in spirit, and we pray for his healing and well-being. We're making a videotape of this year's Parker Lecture, so he can see it later. And because he'll be turning 100 in just a few short months, we wanted to send along a birthday greeting to him. Will you join me? And please stand if you're able and help us sing from First Congregational Church a happy birthday to Dr. Everett Parker.
my music director used to say, why don't you sing the hymns like that? <laughs> when someone has been blessed with a long life of activism, I suspect that he or she can look back with pride at the battles that have been won, and yet some disappointment that some goals still have not been achieved. But I think it must help to know that there are new generations of people that you inspired and who are doing what they can to inspire and mentor the next generation of leaders and activists. There are many people in this room who first met Everett Parker very early in their own careers, and some, I won't name names, are now moving into retirement themselves. But I think they too appreciate the importance of mentoring the next generation of leaders because there was a time when they received guidance and encouragement in their own careers. When I got to spend some time talking with our first honoree, Janelle Trigg, I was not surprised when she brought up the mentoring that she had received from her own faith community when she was growing up in Baltimore. And I was also not surprised when she specifically mentioned the encouragement she had received from someone I knew personally, Dr. Ann Emery, a longtime Baltimore educator and denominational leader and a co-founder of Janelle's Childhood Church, Heritage United Church of Christ. We're so pleased that Anne can be with us this morning. Anne, are you, there she is. <laughs> we honor Janelle today because of her own efforts to pay it forward. Janelle began her career in television broadcasting, working in program production, advertising, and marketing positions in stations in Chicago and Baltimore. During that time, she rose to serve as Director of Marketing and National Sales Manager for WJZ-TV, the CBS station in Baltimore. After 16 years, she decided to pursue a law degree. While in law school, she served as a full-time law clerk to FCC Commissioners Susan Ness and Rochelle Chong. She then worked at the FCC and the Small Business Administration and with the National Telecommunications and Information Administration in roles designed to promote diversity and opportunities for minorities and small business people in the telecommunications industries. She also served as the first executive director and chief operating officer for the Telecom Opportunity Institute, a nonprofit corporation that promotes career opportunities in telecommunications for disadvantaged young people, minorities, and women. Janelle's commitment has not let up since she moved into the private practice of law, now with the law firm of Lerman Center here in Washington. She has served on the board of directors and board of advisors of the Minority Media and Telecommunications Council and as a fellow with the Educa Broadcast Leadership Training Program of the National Association of Broadcasters Education Foundation. Since its inception, she has served as a subject matter expert and consultant to the FCC's Federal Advisory Committee on Diversity for Communications in the Digital Age. She's also served as a mentor of the committee's Funding Acquisition Task Force. The issues and strategies have evolved since the days when Everett Parker first went to court, and the activists have evolved with them. In recent years, Janelle was a key member of the legal team that persuaded a U.S. Court of Appeals to strike down regulations that would have severely hampered the ability of small and minority-owned and woman-owned companies to participate in FCC auctions for wireless spectrum. One of Janelle's clients told us, quote, she has the best attributes of a lawyer. She is committed, she is tenacious, and she gets it in terms of integrating big policy perspective with the nuts and bolts of a given case. I'll note that when I was swapping emails with Janelle last night about our plans for this morning, it was around 8 p.m. and she was still working on a legal matter that she felt she had to get finished before she could go home. The Donald H. McGannon Award recognizes special contributions in advancing the roles of women and people of color in the media. For all of this and much more, we are pleased to present this year's McGannon Award to S. Janelle Trigg. Thank you, Sarah. Commissioners, past and present, my fellow honoree, Charles Benton, Reverend Jackson, distinguished guests, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. 
Many of you have gotten up at the crack of dawn. My family is here. They were up even earlier than that. God bless them. I'd like to introduce them here. Uh, would you kindly stand? My uh, godfather, Dr. Favor, my partner, Steve Bradley, my godmother, Phyllis Anderson, and my mother, Aurora Trigg. First, I'd like to congratulate UCC on this momentous occasion of the 30th anniversary of the Everett C. Parker Lecture and Awards Breakfast. To all my friends at UCC, this is a special day. And to Dr. Parker, Everett, happy birthday. You are very special, one of a kind, and I'm blessed to have known you. Uh, my life, our lives, have been made the better with the work that you've done these past decades, so I wish you the very best. And to my fellow honoree, Charles Benton, I'm delighted to join you as an honoree today. I have a deep appreciation for your enduring service to, to America. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Lucy Carrington Cook was a colored woman who lived on a farm in Halifax County, Virginia. She had only completed sixth grade but she loved to read and keep up with news and current events. She knew that it was wrong that the county school bus did not travel the additional three miles down that dirt road to pick up her young daughter and the other colored children. So she convinced a few neighbors to join her in a lawsuit against the county for discrimination. Lucy Carrington Cook was my grandmother. And that young daughter is my mother, Aurora Trigg. My mother shared this story with me on the day that I took the LSAT and I visited her house because I needed a mama hug. I thought I had failed that test miserably. <laughs> I then told her that I had decided to go to law school. It was the first time I told her that. And at 36 years young, it was a radical change for me. She was very surprised, but she was very proud that her daughter, that the granddaughter of a poor, farmer's wife, would be the first of the family to graduate from law school. Well, Grandma won that lawsuit with the help of a young attorney just starting his legal career, and I'm told that his name was their good marshal. So my grandmother's story about courage and dedication and fairness and equality and justice and opportunity has inspired me through law school and throughout my legal career. So thank you, UCC, for this honor. I'm very humbled by this award. And I'm very blessed to stand here today on the shoulders of my grandparents, on my parents, my extended family, Dr. Ann, my dear friend and colleagues at Lerman Center, and all of those who have fought for justice and fairness and dignity and opportunity, particularly Donald McGannon. I'm told he was a remarkable man, and I wish I'd had the opportunity to meet him. But better yet, I've had the opportunity to share in his ideals, and I pray that I will continue to live up to his expectations. Thank you again, and God bless. Good morning, everyone. My name is Earl Williams, and uh, as chair of the board of directors of OC Inc., it's my honor to introduce the recipient of this year's Everett C. Parker Award. Over the past several decades, Charles Benton has been a leader in the policy debates over media reform, telecommunications policy, digital access, and the role of the internet in education. In the 1960s, Charles became involved with the National Citizens Committee for Broadcasting, one of the first organizations to build on Everett Parker's work. And then in 1973, under Charles' chairmanship, the NCCB board hired retiring FCC Commissioner Nicholas Johnson, the commissioner that rode the bicycle, as executive director to carry on the fight to make broadcasters more responsive to community needs. In 1978, President Carter appointed Charles as chairman of the National Commission on Libraries and Information Sciences. 
and the following year, the President appointed him Chairman of the first White House Conference on Library and Informational Sciences and Services. In 1997, President Clinton appointed Charles to be the Presidential Advisory Committee on the uh, Public Interest Obligations of Digital Television Broadcasters, the so-called Gore Commission. And earlier this year, yet another president, the one who occupies the White House, called on this public servant as President Obama nominated Charles to the National Museum and Library Services Board. Perhaps more important, Charles has been a leader within the philanthropic community, particularly in championing the importance of supporting media to help address social problems and achieve philanthropic goals. Charles's father left instructions telling the trustees of what became known as the Benton Foundation to, quote, favor those things which seem risky, unorthodox, hazardous, and even unlikely to succeed, but which, with success, offer more ordinary promise, and in some cases, very exceptional promise. Over and over again, Charles and the Benton Foundation have taken those instructions to heart, looking for new ways to promote better, more diverse access to our country's media channels. In recent years, Charles and the excellent staff at the Benton Foundation have taken a leadership role in shaping the National Broadband Plan and working alongside OC Inc to ensure that the Universal Service Fund evolves to support high-speed internet services for low-income people. They've also backed the philanthropic Connect2 Compete initiative. And one of the most valuable things the foundation does for the people in this room is to disseminate the Benton Headline Service, a free daily online news summary of important developments in the ever-expanding communications field. In 2004, Charles and his wife Marjorie, who we're pleased to have with us today, were recognized by the Council on Foundations with the Distinguished Grantmaker Award. At the time, a colleague who served on another board with Charles commented that Charles was the single most important force in helping and encouraging foundations to understand the role of media and media policy in contemporary society. In an interview back then, Charles said, the biggest challenge in our society is having the diversity of views that enables people to make reasonable, informed choices because our whole democratic system is based upon an informed electorate. With the consolidation of media outlets into fewer and fewer large corporations, the press is increasingly economics-driven and not truth-driven. The convergence of media ownership into fewer hands presents a real danger and needs to be focused on, especially by those interested in the health of our democracy. Within all other issues, either flourish or don't. Through his work in government business in the nonprofit sector, Charles has demonstrated a long-term, steadfast commitment to the values of access, diversity, and equity that also guided Everett Parker's work. It is my honor to present him with the 2012 Everett C. Parker Award. Charles. Thank you so much. Well, I'm uh, deeply honored with that introduction, thank you so much, uh, and to the Board of uh, uh, the Office of Communications, OC Inc., Cheryl Lianza, thank you so much, uh, uh, and a fellow honoree, uh, Janelle Trigg, uh, for your kind comments, uh, really appreciate it. Um, family Marjorie uh, usually doesn't come to my events, but here she is. <laughs> <laughs> And my sister Helen, uh, thank you for coming from Madison. We really are most grateful. Uh, uh, so, uh, I, to, to the uh, uh, Cecilia Garcia, our executive director of the Benton Foundation, Joanne Hovis, our board member uh, here, I, I believe, uh, and of course, uh, FCC commissioners uh, present and past. So, um, Everett Parker is a role model for us all. 
This is why, uh, for my comments today, I called several old friends to ask how he had inspired them. Let's begin with Annie Schwartzman, who started as a young assistant to Earl K. Moore, Dick Moore, uh, Everett's lawyer on the WLBT case. Andy's three insights from Everett were, one, the work has to be driven by an ethic. Two, you need patience. It takes a long time to accomplish things. Three, don't be afraid of difficult challenges. So let me elaborate on uh, each of these points and drawing from my WLBT gospel, Kamel's book, Changing, Challenge, uh, Changing Channels, The Civil Rights Case That Transformed Television. First, about Everett's ethic. He said, quotes, if you really believe in what the Bible says, and I do, you have to, if you have any ground to stand on or any resource to use, that you can help people who are voiceless. You have to do it, and if you want to act, you have to do it if you want to act as a Christian. And I think that's what drives me. Second, about patience. After the United Church of Christ filed its appeal to the federal court, Everett met with Paul Porter, uh, WLBT's lawyer in Washington. Porter threatened to stretch the case out long enough to bankrupt UCC, to which Parker said, he replied, well, Paul, if it runs 10 years or 15 years, and if you're dead and I'm dead, the United Church of Christ will still be in there. <laughs> Incidentally, the case actually did take 16 years before it was finally resolved. Third, don't fear challenge. Don't fear the challenge. Following its hearings on the case, the FCC, the FCC ruled to renew WLBT's license in 1968, and there were two dissenting commissioners, Ken Cox and Nick Johnson, and they summarized the elements of the challenge as follows. Uh, quote, the case has everything. A racist television station in Mississippi, an offended citizenry that actually takes the expense and frustrating course of involving itself in the license renewal process, a church as a party, Negroes protesting the programming abuse received by that nearly 50% of the people in the station's viewing area who are black, a landmark first impression uh, decision by the U.S. Court of Appeals awarding the, quote, standing to such parties. The station's misrepresentation of the commission over the years. The commission's contortions to keep the public out entirely, then to place upon them the impossible burden of proof that to reverse the, the long-held precedents and ignore the clear suggestions of the court as to the standards to be applied. Even more explicitly, let me quote from uh, Commissioner Michael Copps's September monthly blog that he does for the Benton Foundation on a monthly basis uh, on, quotes, reform the Everett Parker way. Quotes, Justice Berger said that the broadcast industry does not seem to have grasped the simple fact that a broadcast license is a public trust subject to termination for breach of duty. I also spoke to my old friend Nick Johnson, who was appointed by President Johnson uh, to the Federal, Commission, uh, Federal Communications Commission for seven years. Let me tell you a story about how Nick, uh, uh, about, about Nick that was an important part of my finding my own voice, being a late blooming son of a famous and powerful father, William Menton. First, some background. In the late 60s, I joined the board of the National Citizen Committee for Broadcasting, whose chairman was Tom Hoving the director of the uh, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. I remember taking Tom to meet my father in his apartment at the top of the World Earth Towers, and Tom making the pitch about supporting NCCB with a major contribution, which my father agreed to during that meeting. For me, it was a fascinating experience watching my father, who was born in 1900, identifying with a crusading zeal of young Tom Hoving as a mirror of things that he, my father, did in his youth with radio when he was co-founder of Benton and Bowles. 
The U.S. Court of Appeals decision in 1969 to reverse the FCC renewal of the WLBT license opened up the floodgates to citizen intervention. As Kay Mills mentions in her book, between 1971 and 73, more than 340 stations <clears throat> had petitions filed to deny their license renewals. A lot of the work was done by Dick Moore, described by Henry Geller as the backbone of the public interest movement in communications. And Al Kramer, who's here, uh, then head of the uh, Citizens Communications Center with the public support of NCCB led by Tom Hoving. In, the, in late 1972, Tom moved on to other things and I was elected chairman of NCCB. Early the following year, it was announced that Nick Johnson was leaving the FCC and we approached him to see if he might be willing to join the NCC as his staff leader to help us carry on the fight. He agreed to do so if we could raise 100,000 to kick it off. Then on March 18th of 73, my father died, and the fundraiser to clinch the deal was scheduled for his birthday on April 1st. I had to decide whether to postpone the event or go forward with it, and ultimately, the question that drove me was, what would my father have wanted me to do under the circumstances? The answer was obvious, and we moved forward successfully to hire Nick, and as they say, the rest is history. For those who want more of that history, by the way, get Nick's classic book, How to Talk Back to Your TV Set. <laughs> <laughs> One last story. I call my old friend Mark Lloyd, who's also here, uh, and a former Benton Foundation board member, now serving as Associate General Counsel and Chief Diversity Officer at the FCC. In 1997, I was appointed by President Clinton as a member of the Presidential Advisory Committee on the committee, on the committee to, to, of the public interest obligations of digital television broadcasters. I always try to have to take a deep breath before you get all that out. <laughs> uh, one of the early meetings of the committee took place in October 97 and included a briefing from one of the top lawyers affiliated with the National Association of Broadcasters named uh, Erwin Krasnow. He titled his briefing, The Evolution of the Public Interest Standard in Broadcasting. He started with a lengthy description of the beginning of radio broadcasting in the 20s, took us up through the issues of primetime access rule, probably mentioned in passing the Fairness Doctrine. And at the end of these long comments, he asked for questions from the floor. And I remember Mark Lloyd, who was literally sitting on the floor, raising his hand and asking about a case that somehow didn't figure into Mr. Krasnow's history of the public interest in broadcasting. It was, of course, the WLBT case. And Krasnow really had no answer to Mark's question. Let me conclude with how Everett Parker's life work has inspired me and the work of the Benton Foundation. As Everett was trying to give voice to the voiceless, I was trying to find my own voice in carrying on his work and building on the public service traditions of my family, especially through the Benton Foundation. Let me, re let me return to Andy Schwartzman's three insights into Parker's work. Ethic. The Benton Foundation, we've always been guided by the values of access, diversity, and equity. And by demonstrating the value of media and telecommunications for inspiring the quality of life for all. We seek and support policy solutions that enhance our democracy by bringing ever more communities and individuals into uh, uh, identifying the challenges we all face and crafting the solutions that we all need. Patience. I'm constantly reminded that we public interest advocates are engaging in, in a marathon, not a sprint. Many of you know the Foundation's headline service that was mentioned uh, by Earl. Uh, a daily update on our field, been going since uh, uh, 1996 when the Telecom Act was passed. The true value of a service like ours is not measured in a day or a week or even a month, but over the course of years in the relentless chronicling of what we hope will be an arc towards justice. Difficult challenges. I truly carry with me Reverend Parker's desire to, quote, uh, help to people who are voiceless. 
At the Benton Foundation, we continually focus on engaging in policy debates of the day from the perspective of low-income consumers. All too often, the advances in communications bypass the people and communities that would benefit the most from connecting to education, to health care, to public safety, and economic development. And although these may be the hardest populations to reach and connect our democracy <clears throat> and our country suffers until we do.